Eric Mangini's got multiple rings, three Super Bowls while with the Patriots. Jets, Browns head coach. He is joining me now from Cleveland, by the way. I'll get to the Browns in a second. So, you know, you know Tom well, and one of the things I worried about when he went to Tampa, it wasn't that his arm was shot. I didn't care about that. My question was, he had great protection in New England, and Tampa's O-line is average. The second thing is, Bruce Arians is loosey-goosey, and the culture of the organization's kind of been, you know, Ebor City and fun, let's get cocktails early. And I'm like, that's not Tom. Tommy's got a system, and he's pretty rigid. And I'm watching last night, and I'm thinking, you're watching what I'm watching last night, right? Like an undisciplined mess. And I think Tom kind of got unglued on the sidelines, right? Yeah, it, it's interesting. In my career, I was with Belichick, and then I went to Parcells, then I went back to Belichick. I had one year with Ted Marchbrode in between, then I was a head coach, and then I go out to San Francisco, and I'm with uh, Jim Harbaugh, and it's it's a very, very different approach, a very different system. I love him, and I you know respect the things that he does, but it's very different than what I was used to. And And one of the things that Tom, and I'm sure Gronk is getting used to, is that all those issues that were buttoned up in New England that you never had to worry about, whether it it was penalties or being reminded about situational football or or game management, any of those things that were so buttoned up, the discipline, you know, it's not the same everywhere. And yeah, you you know, you may get, you may be having more fun in the off season and you may be having more fun during the course of the week, but 11 penalties isn't fun and losing the game because of self-inflicted wounds isn't fun. And, and Tom's learning about that. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a hard lesson sometimes to learn. What about not shaking hands? Does that bother you? No, I mean, we spent the whole day talking about Mahomes' embrace and, and, and what potentially could have happened and how he could have gotten COVID. And then, and then Tom doesn't shake hands after the game. I mean, I, I assumed it was it was more related to that than it was some sort of um, slight. Uh, it it just it's uncharacteristic for for Tom to do that. I I assumed it was COVID based. All right. So Tyron Smith left tackle out. So the center already retired before the season. Travis Frederick. Tyron Smith is out. Right tackles out. I've always had kind of this theory in the NFL. There's there's certain units. In season, if they go sideways, you're toast. You can't you can't correct them in season. People aren't just giving up left left tackles in this league because there's so there's about six great ones. And I look at Dallas this morning, and and I got to be honest, Eric, I look at them differently. The offensive line's not the same. I don't think you can correct a bad offensive line in week seven, eight, nine, ten. Your, your thoughts on what they're facing? Yeah, the, the offensive line hasn't been the same all, all season long, and and. Uh, this is this is a terrible, and and you saw the last game they they tried to help some of the guys that they brought in. They tried to chip with the tight end and chip with the running back, and you can do some of that stuff, but but you're limited. You're limited in terms of how many times you want to go with an empty formation and only block five on five. But they have they have Zeke, and and if they'll commit to running the ball consistently, game in and game out, you've got a chance to to help that offensive line the most. We talked about last week how it would help the defense, but running the ball helps the offensive line significantly. I remember in 97, we played Barry Sanders, and I'm not saying that that Zeke is Barry Sanders, but we had a chance to go to the playoffs, and we did everything in the world to try to stop this guy, and he still he still broke a big play late in the game. And Zeke has that capability. He has a, the capability to break a big play at any point. It slows down the pass rush. It helps the defense. And and it gives those guys who struggle in pass rush, you know, an, a, a much better opportunity than they're going to have if you want to go out and sling it, you know, fifty times a game. So you know, you're a coach, you're Anthony Lynn, and you want to start Tyrod Taylor. Then the medical guys mess up, and you feel some guilt. And then you put Justin Herbert out there, and he's like, oh boy, this kid's slinging it all over the yard. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a situation for Anthony Lynn. I don't think he wanted to be in it, but how could you go to the team? And go back to Tyrod Taylor. I mean, players, you can't lie to players. Justin Herbert, to me, is, I mean, it looks like the Rose Bowl. I mean, he's just controlling He's controlling the offense. I mean, I'm surprised how good he is. Do you have any sympathy for what Anthony Lynn goes to? Don't Didn't he have to make that move? Yeah, you know, that doctor has probably done hundreds and hundreds of injections. And, and it's sometimes one player's misfortune is 
is a bunch of players fortune and 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 it's it's a difficult thing because as a head coach you want to be consistent and you want your guys to know that they're they're not going to lose their spot due to injury and especially an injury that that had nothing to do with with anything that, that the player did but the guys also want to know that you're really committed to playing the best players and when you say you're doing what's in the best interest of the team to win the game it has to be meaningful and and herbert's come in He's got over 100 quarterback rating. He's completed over 70% of his passes. He's looked better than I, I think anybody expected him to. So it's hard to then go sit in front of the team and say, I'm going to do everything I can to allow us to win the game, but I'm not going to play this guy because I want to be consistent as, as a head coach. Guys, guys understand the business element of it. Yeah, they do. So I watched that Monday night game. Brian Hoyer struggling and Jarrett Stidham. And I thought, I thought Cam Newton may have gotten himself a contract extension for not playing because you couldn't take away how inept they were. And I, Eric, I don't know if Cam is a rental. I think they're going to be too good to get a top 10 draft pick. They're not going to get one of these quarterbacks. Nobody in the AFC is going to give him a break and let him have some of the, and I'm like, I think Cam may end up being a solution for a while. Maybe. Right. It's possible. New England hit the football lottery again. You know, they hit it. We hit it with Tom Brady when we get him in the sixth round. And then you bring Cam Newton in for $500,000 guaranteed. He's he's better than anyone could have expected coming off the injury. He's able to do what he, he did with his feet in the first game and then throw the ball effectively the next game out. And And to say that New England knew something that everybody else did, I, I don't think that's true. You know, the, the contract itself tells you what, what they thought about Cam's potential. But he comes in and, and he's changed the trajectory of the season post Tom Brady. And everybody in New England and everybody in the league got to look at, at what it could be without Cam Newton. And then, you know, if they had to live through, you know, the growing pains of, of, of Stidham. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, when you were in New, Eng New England, you got used to big wins. So if you win a big game on Sunday against the Baltimore, you know, emotionally, that, 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 that's the standard for New England. But Cleveland's different. When you were at the Jets, that's different. And you win a big game, and everybody pats you on the back, and Cleveland beats the Browns, or uh, the Browns beat the Cowboys, excuse me, and everybody now is like, oh, my God, look at this team. Stefanski's brilliant. OBJ's amazing. And I have this, I said this this morning as one of my picks. I said, I'm always leery of losing cultures that win their biggest TV game in years, and then the next week they actually play a much better team, the Colts this week, and the Colts aren't flashy and nobody's talking about it, so I like the Colts over the Browns. But in, but in your life in this NFL, it, cultures are different, and teams that aren't used to winning win big games. Were you ever in Cleveland or the Jets? You won a big game, and you did every trick in the book, and they were still flat the next week. Yeah, unfortunately, I got fired in New York because <laughs> because of that. And look, Teddy Atlas, the the boxing trainer, always would say, "Success is like a martini; it relaxes you." And and. When I was in New York and, and we had far when we were rolling, I think we were seven and two and eight and two. And then we won, you know, one out of our last four or five games. And it, it was, you could see it, you could feel it. The guys were doing a million interviews and, and all kinds of things on the day off. Guys were showing up late. There were mistakes that were made, you know, at that point that hadn't been made before. And you're, you're giving this, this constant speech of, of, look, we're not a, as good as, as we think we are. And suddenly, you know, reality sets in and, and uh, it catches up with you. And, and it's hard. It's hard to teach guys how to deal with success because we spend so much of our time with athletes teaching them how to deal with adversity. But it can be just as difficult a thing to navigate through. Yeah. All right. Well, enjoy your fall in, in Ohio. <laughs> I will. En enjoy your beautiful steak dinner tonight by the beach. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I don't resent you for it. Uh, but... <laughs> That's funny. Coach, it's good seeing you. Get out to California sometime. All right. We'll see you soon. Eric Mangini, one of the good guys. He goes and has steaks with me every time he comes into town. We sit and talk X's and O's. It's so boring to all of America except us.
We sit and talk draft picks and left tackles, and he's the best guy to go to dinner with. It's, he's just, it, it's just unbelievable how much you learn from him every time I go. Great stories, many of which you can't talk about on the air. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.